Um, my name is Michaela Sizemore. I'm a software engineer on the GeoCat team here at NCAR, and I'm going to just be leading our uh, Wharf Python tutorial today. Um, so I know that we sent out an instruction guide on how to do Git clone to get our um, repository and then also set up our Conda um, environment. So we're going to go ahead and actually run through that together for anyone that might have had some issues um, getting everything set up beforehand. So the first thing I would like everyone to do is open up a terminal window, um, depending on if you're Mac or PC, you might be doing that a different way. Um, I run using a Mac, so this is what that terminal window looks like. You can access it just through searching terminal in your search bar up here, um, if you're not familiar with that. Um, and then you're gonna go ahead and just make sure that you're in your root directory um, at the top, just so that way when we clone this uh, GitHub repo, it goes into a place that's pretty easy to access. Um, so in order to do git clone, it's pretty easy to do. You will need git on or in your conda environment, um, whether that's base or whatever um, environment you're using. If you haven't downloaded that already, um, you might end up a little bit behind us, um, but that's okay. Like I said, all of this will be recorded, so you'll be um, good to go in the long run. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat. Oh, wait. Sorry, it is actually trying to um way this is going to come in as a direct message it won't let me send messages to the full chat so if you can just um paste this uh github url to everyone that would be great um so this is our github um repo and you're going to be doing git clone and this is what that url looks like um, i already have it in mine so i'm not going to hit enter but from here you would hit enter on your side if you do not have the repository cloned um, and then it will go ahead and put it into for you. So once that has cloned, you will then see if you do an LS, um, Wharf Python has been um, added as a directory for you um, to go into. Um, that should only take a couple of seconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep going from here. From there, you're going to do CD and then Wharf underscore Python. And you can tab or hit tab and it'll complete and send you um, and then hit enter. And that will take you into your Wharf Python directory. Um, from there, we are now going to um, create our Conda um, environment that we'll be using today. And that Conda environment YML file is right here. So in order to do that, we are going to now say um, Conda env for environment create dash f and then um, 20, 21, and you can tab complete that as well. And then hit enter, and it will go ahead and start creating the Conda environment for you um, that we'll be using today. If you've already done all of these steps and your Conda environment is created and everything, I would definitely um, recommend that once you get into your Wharf Python directory to just do a git pull to make sure that you have everything up to date. If you see this, that means you're up to date. Um, if you aren't up to date and you know your pipe, your um, files aren't the same as what I've recently pushed, which was in like the last hour. Um, it'll just go ahead and update those to make sure that everything is on the same page. So yeah, make sure you do a git pull if you've already cloned everything. And if you're cloning it right now, um, it'll get you the most recent versions. But um, while that con environment is building for anyone that hasn't um, already built it, it will take a couple minutes, like I said. So I'm just going to run over a couple of things that we'll be um, doing today and just a little bit of background on um, Morph Python um, and you know just everything that you might want to know just a quick quick guide. Um, so today we are going to be doing more of a software overview than we have in years past. Um, this was just more of a decision based on time constraints. Um, so in years past they've done a bit of a technical overview of the software um, kind of with like NumPy, XArray, OpenMPI. We're not going to go into that today but the repository does contain all of the old tutorials. So if you want to, you can go back um, and view that um, technical side if that's something you're interested in. Um, today, we're also only gonna be using Cartify Matplotlib. And the reason for that is that um, in years past, we have done overviews with Basemap and Pingle, um, but more recently, they have actually been depreciated and are in maintenance mode. And Basemap actually says that you should be using Cartify um, from 2020 on, which now we're in 2021. So that's why we're going with Cartify today. But um, a brief overview of Wharf Python. It is a post-processing tool that is similar to NCL's Wharf package. It contains over 30 diagnostic routines, such as CAPE, storm relative helicity, 
cloud top temperature and so forth. There are also interpolation routines and then utilities to help with plotting, again, via uh, Cartify, base map, and Pingle. Um, it only works with WARF ARW models, and it is not a tool for running these models with Python. So unfortunately, you still have to use a terminal um, window for running those models. So after this um, tutorial is over, you may find yourself needing some help or finding that our, you know, there's bugs in the code or something like that. The first place that I actually recommend people to go to is our GitHub repository. So our um, Morph Python is an open source software, and we are highly encouraging the public to give us input um, with our development process. So what that means is if you find any sort of functionality that you think that we should add, um, if there's any bugs in the code, anything that might be going wrong, we really do encourage the community to bring that to our attention. So that way we can fix it up and make sure we have the best version of software going out to everyone. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much your one-stop shop of um, where to go if you have any issue, any input, anything that you could want with um, Morph Python. Um, up next, we also have the Wharf Python Talk Google group. This is kind of like our GitHub repository, but um, like the light version of it. So you can go there um, for code issues, user support, and just general questions um, that you might have about the, the software. And then finally is our Wharf Python Read the Docs page. Um, this is really just your guidebook, your, your handbook of everything that is Wharf Python related. So it contains all of the API, the installation guides, and then you know, tables of available diagnostics, FAQs, and plotting examples. And then um, some of you might be asking what happened to NCL's Wharf package, or just you know, why are we using Python? What's, what's the dealio with that? Um, so this is all part of NCAR's recent decision to pivot to Python as our scripting language of choice. Um, for the future development of analysis and visualization tools. So right now, um, NCL is in maintenance mode, meaning that new features aren't being added, and we are actually just um, not addressing anything unless it's a not or anything past um, critical software defects. Um, so with that being said, I do want to reiterate um, that the GeoCat team is dedicated to providing tutorials and example materials um, to help NCL users transition from NCL into Python. Um, and that is actually part of the reason that we are here today presenting on Morf Python um, to all of you. So with that being said, I think we should be getting to a point that most people have finished building their con environment. Um, and then, sorry, I just saw this from Chuck in the um, chat. All of those links and everything are in the file that we're gonna be using today. So you all have access of, to this um, for future reference as well. So don't worry um, too much about that. Um, so as I said, we should be finishing up building um, Conda environments. So I'm going to go Ex ahead and get to the point that we activate that Conda environment. Michaela, uh, excuse me. Could you please share the link to the Jupyter Notebook once again? I think you have already shared it in your email. But for um, like Git clone? The, the Jupyter Notebook, you already opened for everybody's oh, okay. reference. Yeah, that's um, that's actually part of the repository. So when we go, it'll oh. it'll pop up with that. Oh, okay. We, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So for the next step, when we are activating our Conda environment, you should be in your base environment um, currently. But what you're going to do from here is Conda activate, and it is WP underscore ENV for Worf, Worf Python um, environment. And then I will say, um, just to reiterate that if you are behind right now, don't worry. Um, this is recorded and going to be on YouTube. So it's more important to you know, just follow along for now um, if you do get behind by a lot. Um, and then from here, now that we've activated our Conda environment, I would like everyone to do a PWD. So print working directory, and then copy this part right here because this is going to um, be part of the next step in starting and reading in some um, files. So from there, after you've copied this part, your um, directory, go ahead and type in Jupyter and notebook. And if you're not familiar with Jupyter notebook, um, I know it's spelled differently, but that is not an error. And then go ahead and hit enter. And this is going to launch a um, Jupyter server for you. Um, and as you'll notice, this is pretty much exactly what you have in your terminal window for the repository or for one from when you cloned your repository. 
Um, from here, we're going to go ahead and click Wharf Tutorial 2021. Oop, not double click it. And then in there, you all are going to be using Wharf Tutorial 2021. The instructor one is just a filled out version, um, but if you don't want the filled out version and you want to follow along with me, we're going to be using just the tutorial notebook. Um, and then, like I said, everything that I just went over with Wharf um, while everyone was building their environments, um, those are all here. And then all the links go to all of those places for you too. Alrighty, so um, as we get started here, I do have some quick troubleshooting um, options if you do have any issues with importing um, any of the packages or your data. Um, and if you are still having issues and you've tried all of these um, options, definitely go ahead and let us know in the chat. Um, we just wanna make sure you know that Nothing is too crazy um, and correct on everyone's side. So first thing we're gonna do is go here to the line that says Wharf directory. And we're gonna go ahead and just do a control V um, and put in our um, working directory that we just copied. And then for me, I do a forward slash, I think on PCs, you guys might be using backslashes. I'm not completely sure. Um, and then we're going to link it to the Wharf tutorial data that you'll see in this comment. So you can actually just, um, copy that and paste it at the end. Um, and so what this does is it lets um, Jupyter Notebook know that all of our WARF out files that we're gonna be using for this are contained in this directory so it can be read in. From there, that's all you have to add to this. You're gonna just hit run right up at the top. And if everything went correctly, it'll let us know that all tests have passed. Um, you might, if you have an error that says something like there's a misspelling or to double check the directory, Make sure that you use the correct slashes and you know they are in the correct places for your operating system and then also make sure that everything is spelled correctly so again um, it should be under your wharf python tutorial directory and then specifically in the wharf tutorial data directory after that um, so after that we're going to go ahead and just start reading in um, or a wharf out file and just extracting some of the variables so that way we can get used to um, playing around and seeing what's in a WARF out file. So from here on out, um, we will have two separate um, single or variables for our uh, WARF data sets. The one that we're using right now is we're gonna be calling WARF in and that is our single WARF file. Um, the other one that we will be using is defined later on and it's going to be for multiple uh, WARF out files. So first thing we do is we are going to just bring in that WARF in file um, using netcdf data set and then I'm going to uncomment this print statement and then hit run again. And so what that does is it just shows us what has been loaded into Python at this point. Um, and so if you're familiar with WARF, um, WARF out files and specifically just running the, the simulation yourself, you may notice that this looks pretty similar if not identical to the nameless.input file that we um, create before we run WARF. Um, and so this will let you know all of like the information that is within our WARF out file that we are using for our single WARF file name. Um, and then as we get to the bottom, we'll see a couple of fun areas here. The first one is dimensions. And so this one actually links up a bit with the actual shape of the arrays that we'll be seeing um, here in a second. And then right here, we will have also variables. And this is just all of the variables that are contained um, and have been processed with the WARF simulation. Um, and we'll also, again, get into that a little bit here in a second. So now that we've seen that our, oh, goodness, now that we've seen that our WARF out file has successfully, successfully been read in, we'll go ahead and comment back out that um, print WARF in statement and instead move on to printing just specifically a variable from that variables list. So what we have here is we're defining var and then var is gonna say to Python, hey, we're gonna look at WARF in Inside of Warfin, we're gonna look at variables specifically, and the variable that I wanna see is V. And so we'll go ahead and run that. And when we do, we get a little bit of a, of a informational printout from this. So from this, we'll see that V has, um, in its array, we have time, bottom top, south, north, stag, and west, east. And then we can also see a description of it. It is our Y wind component, and it's in units of meters per second and then has coordinates of x long, x lat, and x time. With that being said, you can do this with pretty much any um, 
pretty much any of those variables that were in that list. Um, so right here, I have it just as an example, x lat and x long, I should be a G. Um, and then um, we'll go ahead and move on just from this for the time being um, to be to now look at just coordinates. And so what I'm going to be doing is now selecting from var. So from this, I would like it to show me what is containing coordinates. So based on that printout we just had, we should be expecting to see these three um, listed when I have uh, coordinates printed out. So let's test to make sure that that's, that's what happens. And sure enough, there is our x long, x lat, and x time. So that's what we expected. And so we're, we're happy with that. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and actually look at the data that is contained in var. So what are the values for our um, vwind component? So what this is calling from um, var is it's saying just to select all of the data that's in there and then um, put it into var all dat and then we're just printing that out. So when we run this, as you'll see, it creates a bunch of arrays um, with a bunch of data in it. So this is, again, what we'd expect to see um, is data. <laughs> so we're, we're on a good track here with what we've done so far. I'm gonna go ahead and comment that back out. And now I'm gonna talk a bit about um, selecting specific indexes, um, specifically time indexes from our WARF out file. Um, so the first thing to note is I'm going to actually be selecting the first time step in this, um, in this data set. And you might be wondering why are we using zero and not one? And that is just because Python is zero based. So the first index is going to be zero. So we'll go ahead and run that. And what do we see is that we have all of this data and this is just our first index. Now, for example, I wanted to say I want from the first index to the second index, I would then do a colon and then I'm going to put a two. And you might be kind of confused, why would we use two if you know, the second index should be one, and that's just because this is non-inclusive. So it means that we're going to go from zero all the way up to the third index, essentially. So we're gonna select all of the data through that second index and stop when we get to the third. And when we run that, we notice that it does change a little bit, but we can count out our indexes here. And this is our first one. We can tell actually from these brackets how many there are. So that's our first one. And it's going to end when we see a bunch of brackets again. And then our second one starts where we see a bunch of brackets and then ends right here. So we know that there are two indexes or time indexes, time steps um, in this um, selection right here. So a quick sidebar about subsetting morph out files, because this is something that you will probably be doing um, to some extent, whether it's you know just subsetting for specific time steps or if it's something bigger where you're doing what this next block of code will be doing which is um, actually fully subsetting your WARF, um, WARF out file. So sometimes you'll find that your WARF out file is ginormous. Um, for example, I had one that was 13 gigabytes and I could not share that with anyone and it needed to be shared. So what you can do um, with WARF, uh, so that it can be used with WARF Python, I should say, is you can actually subset your WARF out file for specific variables. Um, and these variables that are listed down here are actually going to be used in about 99% of our um, routines. The other 1% um, can be found by following these steps and then kind of a little bit of trial and error. I do plan on updating our website with these steps and maybe a better version to do it, but that's future work. Um, but so this is what you can do for now. Um, so basically what happens is we use X-Array in order to open the data set instead of netcdf. We then define a new file name and then define a um, list of um, strings of all of the variables that we want to be selecting out of our WARF file, which right now is named DS. So then if you were to be running this currently, you would go ahead and uncomment out um, this line right here. And it will then go, um, it'll go from your data set, so our WARF out file, um, and then it'll take our to include. And so that tells it what variables we want to take from the warp out file. And then it goes and puts it into a new netcdf file with the name new file, which we define up here. Um, and then that new file name should, you know, obviously be updated anytime that you need to be using it um, for each new file that you use it with. Michaela, just for your reference. Uh, many folks report back that their WARF tutorial data 
uh, folder is coming empty. Do they yeah. have to do anything for that? Maybe recursive cloning or something like that? It shouldn't be because it was part of the tutorial before. Let me just- I found it. it this morning. It's in a different directory. I just downloaded the files manually. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, we had to uh, manually download them and then put them in the folder. Okay. okay. That's interesting. Yeah. The okay, files are in the attention. teaching break. Okay. So yeah, I guess that'll be something that we'll have to fix after the fact then. Um, I'm sorry that that's happening to everyone. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess, you know, if you are having that issue, just go ahead and follow along with this um, for now, and then we'll get that fixed up after the tutorial's over. Um, Alrighty, so yeah, moving on um, now at our first point that we're going to be um, using more Python functions. Um, so get var is going to end up being pretty much your bread and butter function. You're using it almost with every thing that has to do with Warf Python. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do um, is define HGT, which is gonna stand for height in this case. Um, and then that's what we're gonna be extracting from our Warfin variable, which is also, you know, our Warf out file, our single one. Um, so to go ahead and get started with get var, the first thing you do is you do add, your first argument is going to be where your data is. So in this case, it's Warfin. Um, depending on what you, you know, you name it, you change it um, and so forth, but it's just going to be where your data is, what your data set is. The second argument in there is what variable you want. And so for this one, we're going for height, so H-I-G-E-T. And then the next part here is time index. Um, so we're gonna use all times to begin. And all times is technically synonymous with none, but it also, so means that we're just, we're syntaxing, we're looking at all times. And so that's why it's both none and all at the same time. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. And from this, um, we're looking first at our shape right here. And then this is all of the data that's contained inside of it. Um, what's really nice about GetVar is that it does preserve metadata unless you turn off metadata, which is um, another argument that can be added in there that's optional. But that metadata does tell us that our units are in meters and then gives us a little bit of a description here um, that we're looking at our model height and then the coordinates. And then also right here is our projection. Um, this is going to be necessary later on when we are plotting um, as it can be fed into CartaPy, which is very convenient. So uh, from there. Oh. Michaela, could you please a little bit increase your font at this point? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Let's yeah, thank you. This will work the way that I want it to, maybe. Alrighty, is that a little bit better? I'm hoping. <laughs> okay. That's great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, alrighty, yes. Yeah. So once we get through um, just this first one, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at when we use an integer instead of using all times. So this is where, this would be a case where we're selecting um, something, for example, like um, our first time step for this, um, Warf out file. So when we go ahead and print that, one of the things you'll notice is that this now becomes a, or now only has three values in the array um, for the shape instead of four. And then additionally, we're also missing the time um, variable. Um, that And that's what was there before, right? So the reason that this is happening is basically we're just selecting out for time. We're, we're now saying, you know, the only one that I want to look at in this, you know, folder of uh, files is that I am looking at just the first index. And that's why that disappears. Um, so the shape does change, but the metadata is preserved and you'll still see that below um, this <laughs> when we do our printouts. Um, so that's the difference between um, time indexing with all times versus just you know an integer um, and what you would see in the differences of those shapes um, overall. So to get a little bit use, more used to, out of get far. We're now gonna just do a couple more examples. Um, so the first one being our sea level pressure. And we're gonna play around a bit with the units argument. So the first thing that we'll do is just have no argument for units. This is just gonna run with its default for sea level pressure, which is in hectopascals. Again, we do have that listed in our metadata right here. So if you're ever not sure what might be going on um, or what units your data set is using, 
it should be in um, hectopascals unless you define it otherwise. Now, if we are trying to say, okay, instead of using hectopascals, I'd really like to use, you know, pascals. So we'll go ahead then and say units equals, and then open some quotes and just PA. And so that, you know, stands for pascals. Um, what we would expect to see from the new array is that this decimal should move two places to the right. So let's go ahead and see if that's true. And sure enough, it is. We have now seen that that decimal point goes to the right. Um, a different unit that we can look at that's not so easy to convert is uh, millimeters of mercury. Um, so we can go ahead and now, oops, not HH, we'll put millimeters of H um, of mercury in for our units. And we'll go ahead and run it again. Now, as you can see, the, the um, outputs have changed. And even down here, the units now list that were in millimeters of mercury. Uh, so another one that we'll look at with a little bit easier of a conversion rate that we can kind of do in our head, um, we'll look at temperature. So the default on temperature is going to be um, Kelvin. So we'll go ahead and run this and make sure that that makes sense, which, yep, at 303, we'd expect that to be Kelvin. But again, double checking down here, we can see that yes, the units are in Kelvin. So the first one we'll, we'll translate over to for units is going to be degrees of Celsius. Um, so we should expect to see that this will de um, these values will decrease by 273.15. Um, and so that puts us at a rough estimate of about 30 degrees Celsius. So let's run it. And sure enough, this first one is about 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, the next one we'll look at is um, degrees of Fahrenheit. Um, and so looking at 30 degrees Celsius, that tells me that we should be somewhere in the ballpark of 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll go ahead and run this. And sure enough, it's 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's really nice about Wharf Python is that a lot of these functions are able in a, a realm of convenience. So instead of you having to write out you know, lines of code in Python that say how to convert um, degrees of Celsius into degrees of Fahrenheit, you just plug it into this um, get var function and it's, it does it for you. So it's, it's very convenient to use um, Wharf Python even if you're just doing some data manipulation at the end of the day. Um, so the next thing we'll go ahead and play around with is just using some um, using multiple Wharf out files instead of just a single one. So that way we can um, kind of look and compare what the differences are between um, the two methods. From here on out, we will have um, more WARF files defined as our multi-file um, call when we are trying to plot multiple things uh, or multiple WARF out files. So I believe we use this again um, just later on when we're doing actual projections. So the first thing we will do is um, go ahead and I'll have it print out our WARF files. So that way we can verify that all three files from before that we read in at the top are going to be in this or files um, variable that we are defining. Oops. Oh, sorry, I need to comment that out. Alrighty, so what we would expect to see, as before, you can see that this looks very similar to our single wharf in file, um, but now we wanna see that there will be three of them in here and that'll verify that we have read in all three of those files. So if we count them, we have one, we go down and we have our data here. And then we can verify here's the start of the second one and then the data for it here and then our third one and the data for it is here and that is where it ends so perfect we have successfully routed in um, three files and assigned them to um, the variable morph underscore files so with that we'll go ahead now and um, use get var on this uh, wharf files variable um, and we're going to go ahead and just select for sea level pressure. So right here, when we uh, give it our variable name, just SLP is good. And then for time index, we're going to start with all times, just to show how um, the differences are, or how it looks a little bit different with um, subsetting for time um, when we have multiple files. And then we're also going to just change the units for practice. We're going to put them over into millibars. Um, and then let's go ahead and comment back out the print morph files and then uncomment print sea level pressure. So when we do that, we can now uh, notice a couple of things. So first of all, time now is equal to nine instead of four. So that alone tells us that we have more time steps 
um, contained in our sea level pressure um, output. And then as we go down, um, another thing we can verify with is this time coordinate right here. And as you'll notice, it now, oh, goodness, it'll go from uh, 2005, 08, 28, and it goes all the way to 2005, 08, 29, which from the three files that we read in, we know that this is encompassing all of the dates that um, those files are also encompassing. Again, we still have our other metadata, such as um, the projection, our coordinates and units, and then description. So everything is working almost you know, functionally the same as it has when we're using uh, get var with a single file. So something that you may be asking is, well, you know, what is the difference between using all times and using an int for when I have multiple files? You know, what, what's the difference? So like I said, we do now see that we have nine um, possible time steps that we can select from. And we also know that it's across three files. So the first one that we'll go ahead and select for is just the first time step, so at, at position zero. Go ahead and run this. And as we would have expected based on our previous knowledge is that the time um, variable here disappears. Um, and then down here, something that's a little bit different is that we now see our time that we've been select or that we selected for is just 2005-08-28. So this, are, this is our first possible um, index. If I wanted to now go to my second file, I'm going to go to index um, four instead. And then this one, so based on what our three files that we read in, should be coming in at um, 05, 08, um, 28, and then at uh, 12 o'clock noon. So let's see if that's what happens here. And then sure enough, we'll see that that time has changed here and it's now at 12 noon um, instead of you know at the, at the start point that we saw before. Um, and then our final index for this one, again, because it was nine, we know that the last or the final one will be eight. And then that should also match the final file that which um, ended at, on the 29th. So let's double check that that lines up. And sure enough, 2005, 08, 29. So perfect. Our final time step is um, where we would expect it to be when it, with respect to um, the files that we were using. So moving on from that, um, when we are reading in multiple files, you might be wanting to combine variables across multiple files. There are two methods to do this. The default is cat, um, and this is just gonna be combining your variable along the time dimension. Um, but you will, like it says, you want to order your files yourself. So you do want them in um, chronological order. And then the other method is join, and this is creating a whole new dimension on the leftmost um, part <laughs> for each uh, file. So we'll go ahead and play around with this just so that way you guys can see the um, differences between the two methods. So the first one we're gonna try out is cat. So just fill in in method cat. And then first let's just print out our shape and then um, we'll compare that with the shape of using method of join, oops, join, join, there we go. And then again, uncomment out so that way we can see our two shapes. So run both of these boxes and something that we'll notice right away is that this is, um, there's only three values in this array, but in this one, there's four. So what is, um, so based on what we know so far, this might be a little bit confusing. Why are these different? Where is the four coming from? Um, but rest assured, we will go into this. So next, go ahead and uncomment out the print statement for the sea level pressure of each. And then in this one, we can go ahead and line up what each of these uh, values are. So the first one, nine, is telling us that there's just nine time indexes, which we've already seen that from our previous examples. So that makes sense to us. But when we come down here to using the join method, it's a little bit murky because it doesn't make sense. Why are we having four? So as you'll see that the first one is the three is representing our, how many files we have, which makes sense because we know that we've read in three files. And then right here, we have time is four. Now, if, we, if you recall all the way back to when we were just using the single WARFIN file, you may remember that we only had four time indexes. And so basically what's happening with our join method is that as it says in our description, it's creating a leftmost dimension for each file. So essentially what happens is these are now read in as three files, each one having four time steps. Um, and it's just slightly different for how we would be expecting um, or from what we've been using before. However, based on the idea of what a single WARFIN file looks like, um, 
with regards to the data we're using today, um, this time being four does make sense. So this is what we'd expect based on um, what we know um, so far. So coming out of that, we're gonna go ahead and dive into some of the interpolation routines that um, Morph Python offers. So overall, there are four categories of routine. We have interp level, vertical or vert cross, V interp, and then interp line. Um, today, we're only gonna be focusing on interp level and vert cross just for time purposes. Um, but if you are able to uh, practice and kind of figure out how to do things with these two, um, you'll be set up pretty well for V interp and interp line. Um, additionally, the API for these interpolation routines are linked um, in, the, in the file, so you'll have that resource as well. So the first one we'll be looking at is um, interp level. Um, so it's, it's a pretty easy function. It helps you to get um, the field at your specified height, which can be or for either height or pressure level. Um, it's just a, a regular in linear interpolation. Um, so if, you've, if you're familiar with what an interpolation is, um, you'll, you'll be doing just fine um, with this one. So first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and define our pressure and height variables using get var. Um, so for this one for pressure, um, the variable name is just pressure. And then we're gonna use it at time index zero for simplicity. And then for height, we're going to be using um, Z as our height. What's interesting about Z is that it actually can also be um, height. They are almost interchangeable. It's, it's up to you which one you would like to use, but for our examples, we're gonna be using Z. And then for consistency, our time index should be the same as pressure, so it's at zero. And then for this one, we're gonna use um, meters for our units, which should also be our default as is, but just for practice. Alrighty, so then when we're using um, interp level, there are three arguments that we're going to be supplying to this function. So the first argument is called field 3D, and this is the field to be interpolated um, to. So for this, we are interpolating um, the, or what is, okay, <laughs> so what we're interpolating um, is going to be height. So what we're finding out overall is the height of the 500 hectopascal level for our data set. Um, so the first thing we add in is we say, all right, we're, we're interpolating height. The second ar argument here is called vert, and that just stands for our vertical coordinate. So here, we're going to be putting in pressure, or press, as we've designed, or um, defined it before. And then our third argument is desired lev. Um, and this is just the level to interpolate at, and it has to be in the same units as vert. So for this, like I said, we're doing the 500 hectopascal level. So if we just go ahead and put in a simple 500.0. Um, we do not need to, you know, write in HPA at the end. It pretty much is able to just guess based on that. Um, as long as this is not something outlandish, it'll work essentially. So make sure that you aren't putting in something crazy for your pressure, like 10 million, you know. Um, so let's go ahead and print out what height 500 looks like for us and see if these values kind of make sense. So from what we're seeing here, uh, our array is telling us that the um, 500 hectopascal level of um, its height is going to be about um, 5,900 meters. So based on my, my understanding of heights and pressure levels, we would expect that um, the 500 hectopascal level is somewhere around five kilometers up. And from what we're seeing here, um, we are still within a reasonable range um, with this interpolation and the, the values that it's giving us. Additionally, um, this does all contain our metadata like we've had before. So we still have our time. It lets us know what our index is obvious, um, that we've selected, obviously. And then um, along with that, we still have our coordinates, our, our projection here. Um, so yeah, it's pretty convenient how that works out for us, especially when it comes to plotting, as you'll see later on today. Um, next up will be our vertical cross section function. Um, so this one uses a little bit more um, in depth or is, uses just a little bit more um, functions in it just because we are going to need to define a, a line on the ground essentially that we are going to be um, doing our vertical cross section across. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually tell Python to grab from our warfin file in the variable section. We want our latitude coordinates. And so those are um, stored under x lat. So we'll put that in there. And then our longitude is going to be x long. Um, and we'll supply that for the longitude coordinates. Uh, next, we, use, or we go ahead and set um, a coordinate start point. And the way that I do this is um, just by using NumPy to find the absolute minimum of our latitude coordinates and then our absolute minimum of our longitude coordinates. So that way I know that this is definitely the um, bottom left coordinate of our projection. Um, and then for our end, I do the reverse. I'm going to actually do the absolute max of our latitude coordinates and then our absolute max of our longitude coordinates, um, just so that way we're making pretty much just the diagonal line across our um, data set. From there, we're going to use coordinate pair, which is a, also a Wharf Python um, function. And from this, we are basically supplying what we want our um, start point, which will be an array to have as its data. So the first part of this is we supply our latitude um, for our start point. And that start point is going to be based off of court start, which is up here, position one, um, which is our latitude. So that lines up. And then for longitude, it's going to be court start again, but it's gonna be position two, which again lines up with our longitude here. Um, endpoint, same logic, we're using a coordinate pair, but instead now we're using our endpoint and then our longitude endpoint. So our latitude endpoint and our longitude endpoints and supplying those in there. Now we wanna go ahead and grab some wind speed. Um, so that way we can use that as what we are um, putting into our vertical cross section. So we're gonna use get var again. We have our warfin file. And then the name of the variable for this is called, uh, well, it's WSPD wind speed underscore WDIR wind direction. And we are gonna go ahead and do this at time index zero, and we're gonna give it units of knots, um, which the default, I believe, is meters per second. Um, next up, we're gonna go ahead and get our height values, which we've done um, previously. So all we need to supply here is Z, and then match our time index, which is zero. And then down here, we're gonna go ahead and actually do our vertical cross um, computation. So in vertical cross is very similar to um, the interp level. Um, so the first thing we add in is uh, field 3D. And for this case, it's going to be wind speed and um, wind direction. And then we give it our vert, which is again, vertical coordinate. And that for this is again, height. Um, and then these ones already filled in for everyone. So we have wharf in is wharf in. Um, and that is used just to obtain the map projection for when we're using latitude and longitude coordinates. Um, and then next up is our start points and end points. And then these are just representing the location on the ground. Um, if you were to think about this in an X plane, it would be the X um, coordinate for that. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and see what happens um, with this and if it makes sense. So one of the things that I'll be looking at first is that the values for the wind speed that are closer to the ground are going to be lower than the ones that are um, up above. And the reason that I would expect that these ones towards the ground are lower, um, lower wind speeds, is because of you know, surface drag, um, friction, you know, things like that. But as we go up in the atmosphere, we would expect that there's less friction, less drag, um, and therefore the wind speeds are higher. And that's what we're seeing. And then you'll also notice that we have a bunch of NAN um, values in this. So a lot of times you will see NAN in, in just your computations and everything like that. Um, don't panic when you do. So NAN usually just means that there's either that the uh, simulation provided that there's no data for where it was. And so filled in the value with, I believe it's negative 9,999.999, um, which is then auto converted by Wharf Python into NAN, or it means that there was a value there that didn't make sense. Um, and so then it is again, just translated automatically into NAN. Um, a value that wouldn't make sense, for example, would be if for some reason we had a wind speed that is below ground. Um, so then it would automatically say, no, this isn't real and then kick it out as NAN. Um, but this won't enter, or this won't affect your ability to plot the data later on or anything like that. Um, and that's just because Python is wonderful sometimes. <laughs> 
Alrighty, and then as you'll see as we scroll down, um, again, metadata is preserved with um, the vertical cross section. So if you guys would like me to, I can take a five minute break just to double check that we're all good um, with the questions and stuff. If not, um, we can go through this, the plotting part and then save questions to the end. Um, does anybody have a specific preference? Um, we have two questions, Michaela, right now in the chat interface. So yeah. it may be good to uh, answer them at least. Yeah. Uh, what, um, which two questions are you looking at, Orhan? Uh, okay, the one is, if I want to interpolate wind in a specific height, which is the suitable method? Um, so if you wanted to do, so yeah, let me get back to this one. So if you wanted to do it with a specific height, um, it would almost be kind of reverse to what we have here. So instead of pressure being your second argument, you would put height. Um, and then you would just make this your height. So interp level does work both ways, whether you wanna do a pressure or a height. Um, you just have to adjust these accordingly. Um, additionally with, you know, your uh, get vars and everything. So I think because I haven't tested it myself, but the way that it, the way this would change would be um, instead of pressure being here, you could, for example, do um, wind speed, wind direction, read that in, keep your height here and then your interp level here um, would read your wind speed, wind direction, height here, and then the height in meters that you wanted to interpolate to for your wind speed. Um, so I, I hope that, it's, mm -hmm. that answers that question. And then. And there was one other question about the variable names, but someone mm -hmm. else also answered that from the diagnostics. Uh, okay, page. Yeah, and I was going to say, I do have that linked in here. Let me scroll back to it so that way you guys know where to oh, reference. Okay. Later yeah, on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it is kind of towards the topic, like the first 25% of this notebook. Um, right here, if you just uh, go to the get var user API, it has a whole uh, table and then also the available um, like keyword arguments that you can use, um, such as units and um, other things like that for each of these variables. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other questions about some errors and issues, but I'm not sure if you would like to respond to them right now or record them down. I, I can record them down and we can respond to them afterwards if you yeah. wish. Um, okay. Let's do that. And then I will say too, if it, if it seems like it would be something helpful for everyone participating, maybe we can open an issue on the um, Wharf Python repository. That's just yeah. a list of all of the questions and then answers for everyone to reference yes. later. Yeah, that would be great actually. Cool. So yeah, um, for, for the folks having issues throughout the uh, tutorial today, we would highly recommend go open a create, uh, create an issue either in the Wolf Python repository or the Wolf Python tutorial repository. And then Michaela and I can respond to them afterwards. And there is one more question if we have time, Michaela. Yeah. The question is, do you have an example code utilizing Wolf Python to convert non Wolf NetCDF files into Wolf formatted NetCDF files. I'm looking for this example to prepare data for Vapor primarily since I wanna do conversion on Windows without NCL. Um, so conversion- I did not, mm -hmm. but if I'm understanding the question correctly, is it maybe with respect to just using Wharf Python to go over non Wharf mm -hmm. NetCDF file? Okay, and I think I just recorded down this question. We can we can double check with our Vapor developer uh, colleagues at Ankar. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, I'm not sure how we can reach back out to the folks here, but I think they or other folks can help us uh, mm -hmm. respond to these questions afterwards. So yeah, again, I, I just recorded that, that down and I will be checking with the Vapor developers, they may have similar solutions to 
similar questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, one we can, other we can question. put that also in the, the okay. issue that we put on. Issues, yeah. Yeah. Can I use other projections than Mercator in my WARF run? Um, yeah, so if you were to do that, as long as they are defined with Cardify, um, you should be fine. Um, but today, all of the ones that were, we, all of the projections are going to be uh, Mercator. Merc yeah, um, unfortunately. So, but otherwise, yeah, if, I think I've used um, a Lambert conformal projection um, with WARF Python in the past. So as long as it is defined in Cardapy as projection, um, then you're, you'll be good to go to use the, the get Cardapy function that we're about to be using, so yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and let me just make a general announcement. So someone else uh, still said WARF underscore tutorial underscore data folder is empty. Uh, for those whose that directory is coming empty from git uh, clone, I just provided throughout the chat interface, the correct recursive git clone command where you guys run and can receive all the folders uh, uh, with the content. So please, please check with the previous uh, messages and then you will be able to see those, those correction there. Okay, and let me quick see. Um, okay, so the, the rest of the questions are um, the folks questions and responses to each other as far as I can understand. So I think we should be good for the second uh, part, Michaela. Alrighty, so um, from here on out, we're gonna basically just be um, looking over how to plot with Wharf Python. Um, so the two main things that we'll be introducing in this section is get Cardify and then lat long uh, chords, uh, both of which are Wharf Python functions. Um, and then just a quick note for everyone because we're about to uncommon a big chunk of code. If you are running um, Jupyter Notebook on command, um, you can use command plus your uh, backslash or forward slash. Um, it's the one that's underneath the question mark. Um, and that'll uh, uncomment and comment lines. And then if you're on a PC, it's just you switch it to control and then the same um, slash. So first thing that we'll go ahead and do is uh, get var for sea level pressure at time index zero. Um, so let's go ahead and type that in. Sea level pressure, time index zero, awesome. And then as you guys will probably remember is that when we use get var, we have um, metadata uh, it's copied over with it. So we'll go ahead and now use cart proj with, uh, with uh, we'll define cart proj and use get cartify, which will then go into sea level pressure. So we're gonna tell it to look at sea level pressure, that variable we just created. And it's able to then select the cartify pro projection that is listed in the data set there. Um, next up will be our lat longs chords. And this one again will direct it back to sea level pressure. Um, and that will allow um, Morph Python to then go through our um, variable sea level pressure um, and select out the x lat and x long uh, coordinates and then assign them accordingly here. So just to verify that that did happen, um, we'll go ahead and uncomment um, this print statement. So the first thing that should come out is our Cartopi projection, um, then a new line, that's what this represents, and then lats and then our longs. So let's go ahead and make sure that that did run the way that we wanted it to. So we should first see our cart proj, which yep, it's a Mercator um, projection. Then we see our uh, latitude variable, which is tied to x lat, and then our x long, um, which is tied to longitude um, as we just defined it. So everything did indeed come out the way that we wanted to. So let's go ahead and plug all of these into the rest of our code and see what happens. So first thing we're gonna do is create a figure um, with the fig size 1010, 10, and then create a, an axis object. And here we do need to set our projection. The first one that I would like us to look, look at is actually just the base um, Cartopi plate carre projection. Um, and make sure you do add these um, close parentheses and then your front and end parentheses match up. And then this right here, just adding the coastline so that way we can see an outline of the um, 
continents um, as we have it printed. So this is yeah, just our base uh, play car projection. Um, and then we'll go ahead and see to verify again that our cart proj variable that we have up here does indeed change that from um, the previous one into a Mercator one um, as we were expecting. So let's scroll down just so we can see this happen. And sure enough, we are now looking at a different map projection. And if you're familiar with map projections, you'll know that this is indeed the Mercator projection. So that is good, that checked out and we're happy with that. So now let's go ahead and uncomment this big block of code here. Um, and you guys can just kind of follow along as I go through because this is a Wharf Python tutorial, not a Carter Pi or Matplotlib. So you don't necessarily need to worry too much about these parts. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna go ahead and define is some levels, and this is going to be our contour levels. Um, so this will be used in both of our contour calls right below. Um, and right now we have it set up to contour from 999 um, hectopascals up to um, 1030 hectopascals by steps of 2.5 hectopascals. However, it is non-inclusive of um, 1030. So the maximum contour level will actually be 10, or sorry, 1,200, ah, 1,027.5 hectopascals um, when we actually finish this out. And then the next step here is we're gonna go ahead and just add in some contour lines. Um, so what's really nice about how Carter Pi interfaces with matplotlib is that if we were to, when, or when we provide the lawns and lats argument here, um, it's able to then subset our projection and it um, puts it into the extents that are given with lawns and lats. So we don't have to do that manually. Um, and then we'll go ahead and let it know that we wanna put the sea level pressure data above it we tell it the levels that we want to have as our contours, um, set the color for those contour lines, which is black here. And then this is actually pretty important to remember is the transform argument in this, because what it does is it tells matplotlib that we are um, plotting latitude and longitude data, and we're not using something like inches, centimeters, whatever, so that these latitude and longitude um, coordinates are presented as latitude and longitude. Um, otherwise, it does kind of mess up your uh, projection. And then um, after we put on those contour lines, we're gonna actually fill them. And the difference between this one and this one is this F, the F stands for filled, um, but it's pretty much the same functionally. So we have lawns and lats, then we go ahead and put our sea level pressure, tell it the levels we're going for and transform it. The only major difference here is that we use CMAP instead of colors. Um, so the CMAP that I'm using or color map um, is Veritas and I usually use Veritas or Magma as my two color maps of choice. Um, and this is just an accessibility thing. So um, individuals that are impacted by color blindness sometimes have difficulties seeing um, differences in the data that are on these projections. And so by using um, C maps like Veritas and Magma, there's a highly contrast or a high contrast between the colors that are on the projection. And so it just helps with alleviating um, their, their vision impairment. And then additionally, just kind of like a second feature of using these two color maps is that um, when you print them out in black and white, it's you don't lose as much of the data um, as you would if you have something that is not highly contrasting. Um, and I always make a point to point that out just because as scientists, it is kind of our job to make sure that our science is as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And this is one way to do that. So let's go ahead and see what our projection is looking like at the moment. And so once we go ahead and run that, we'll see that we have our filled contours with black outlines and then a color bar on the side that lets us know what each color is representing. Um, as you'll see here in the center, there's a big piece of data missing. So if you're wondering, are we missing data? Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> the reason why we are not able to see data here is actually because of where we set our levels at. Um, and I did this on purpose. <laughs> so the best place to have started our levels was actually at 980 and not 990. Um, and this is something that you can actually kind of solve by doing a NumPy A min on sea level pressure um, and then an A max as well. So you would know what your range should be to encompass all of the, all of the data that's there. Um, so once we run this again, we'll see that um, 
that center hole is actually filled in and that there isn't data missing. It was just, we pretty much said to um, Python, hey, we're gonna only look at data that starts at uh, 990 when we had data that started at 980 instead. Um, another thing that I wanna point out um, is how to actually manually set the extent of the map projection. So for example, if you wanted to be looking more so at this, this hurricane that we have here in the center, you would be able to call AX dot set underscore extent, and then you open parentheses, open some brackets, and then you do your leftmost bound. So for this one, it's gonna be negative 90, so that's 90 west. And then um, your rightmost, which will be um, for this one, negative 80. And then um, your most southern point, and then your most northern point. So for this, we have um, 20 and 28. And so when I do that, as you can see, it zooms in um, by basically telling um, matplotlib to ignore any data that is linked to a um, latitude or longitude that's outside of these ranges. So that's a, that's a pretty um, nice function to have. And it does work the other way. If for some reason you wanted to show um, data from, we'll say negative 120 um, over to negative 80, and then we'll give this from zero to 28, just to show some white space, you can do that. And that also will show um, the bounds of your data set. So that's just um, some way to manually set your extents. Um, and it's not too, not too difficult, which is nice. So the next thing we're gonna go ahead and do is um, learn how to overlay multiple diagnostics. Um, the first one, or for this one, we're gonna be looking at dew point temperature, sea level pressure, and our winds. So let's go ahead and add in um, our variable names. So the first one we have here is sea level pressure. It's time indexed at zero. Next one is going to be TD2. And then we're gonna make its units in degrees of Fahrenheit. And then next, this one is called UA and its units are going to be in knots. And then we're gonna have VA and its units are going to be in knots as well for consistency. All of these are in the same time index, again, for consistency. Um, and so we're good to go from there. From this, we'll then go ahead and just grab um, some of the metadata so that way we can get our cartopi and our lat and long heart coordinates. Um, so we just reference it back to sea level pressure. You could theoretically do it with any of these, but sea level pressure is easiest to type. Um, and then from there, as we did before, we go ahead and create a figure and then set our, or define our plot or our axes object with our Cartopi projection, which we know is gonna be the Mercator because we haven't changed our actual um, Warfin file and then add some coastlines. And so this is where things are just slightly different. We are actually gonna define two um, level arguments. The first one is for sea level pressure, um, sea level pressure levels, um, which as we have from before is from 980 to 1030. Um, by uh, increments of 2.5. And then for our um, two meter dew point temperature, um, it is actually from 48 degrees Fahrenheit to 85 by uh, three degrees. Uh, so the first one we go ahead and add on there is we're going to do our sea level pressure and we're gonna make these just our contour lines. Um, so as we did above, we go ahead and put in lawns and lats and then let it know that the data we're using is sea level pressure. And then specifically the levels that we want our contours to be at are going to be referenced to the sea level pressure levels here. We go ahead and add in our colors and our transform argument and we're good to go there. And then we will add in a um, filled contours for our two meter dew point. Same functions, we add our lawns, lats, but this time we are now saying, look at our two meter dew point temperature variables and our levels are coming from the two meter dew point temperature levels that we defined. Um, in this one, I did use the magma color scheme. Um, so you'll get to see what that looks like. It's a little bit easier to look at when we have multiple things overlaid. So that's why I chose that one this time. Um, and then we will go ahead and add in some wind barbs um, and we're thinning them. So this is just because there would be a lot of wind barbs if we didn't thin them out. So this chunk of code right here um, we'll go ahead and take the shape of our longitude and then pretty much say we're only going to extract every seventh one. So once we go into plotting our barbs, um, we feed that in and let it know, hey, only look at every seventh longitude based on our thin argument. 
and then every seventh latitude and so on and so forth for our U and B data as well. Um, and then right here, you'll notice we're using two underscore NumPy or NP, which is again, a Wharf Python function. Um, and what that does is it takes the X array data array form that these are usually coming out in and turns it into a NumPy array. Um, and the reason that we wanna do that here is just because um, the matplotlib barbs function prefers NumPy arrays over X array. Um, and so that way it can actually work. Um, and then again, we do need to supply a transform argument because once again, we are using latitude and longitude as our uh, coordinate reference here. And then we just supply a color for these. Um, and then um, this one's a little bit different. We're adding a C label. So that means a contour label to our C level pressure contours. And then the format of that is that it's going to be um, strings. So it's just gonna be a string of numbers um, for each contour. Um, that we have drawn. And then finally, just adding a color bar to represent our um, data that is contained for a uh, two meter dew point temperature. So let's go ahead and run that and make sure everything comes out the way we want it. So as you'll see, as we have our contours for our pressure, all of them are labeled thanks to C label. And then um, we have our wind barbs, which are in green, and then our temperature underneath all of that. Um, some way that we could um, verify that this is accurate is that around a low pressure, we would want to see rotation that is counterclockwise. And based on these wind barbs, it is indeed going counterclockwise. So good to see, good to know. Um, and so the next one we're gonna do is, um, or the next example we'll have here is actually plotting heights with winds. So this is gonna be similar to that question that asked if we could do this. Um, so with this one, um, if you were to do it just to a, um, a height level instead, just flip around a couple of things and you'll be on your way. So let's go ahead and add in our variables to extract. The first one is gonna be pressure. The second one is going to just be Z and its units now are gonna be decimeters. Um, we next have our UA wind in knots and then we will have our VA um, also in knots. And then finally, our wind speed, wind direction is going to be um, added in here as well as a variable that we'd like to extract. So now let's go ahead and take some practice with our interpolate um, functions. The first one is for our height. Um, so with this, we are saying we want our height to be interpolated against pressure. And then we are wanting to go to 850 um, hectopascals of pressure. Um, for our U coordinate, we are then gonna do UA to pressure P and then that pressure is 850 again. And then very similar for VA, it's pressure to pressure level 850. And our final one is going to be our wind speed. So WSPD to pressure P and that pressure being 850. From there, we'll go ahead and grab our data for our latitude and longitude coordinates and then also our Cartify projection um, as we've done already and then um, go ahead and create our figures, set our axes, um, and add some coastlines, all of the fun things that we do. Um, for this case, we're going to go ahead and make our height into our contours this time instead of pressures. So our um, line, con her contour lines are gonna be with respect to height. Um, and then instead of, like I said, the pressure that we've been seeing before. With that, um, I do, want to point out the Zorder with this call. And that is because, so the way that you use Zorder is to let Python know um, how you want things to stack on top of each other. So for this example, I wanted um, the height 850 data to be on top of the wind speed 850 data. So I created, or I gave it a higher Zorder than um, wind speed has. Um, and then from there, we go ahead and again, just add in some C labels to our contours and move on to our wind speed contours. Um, so this is a little bit different for our levels um, for wind speed. The reason that we are not using N or NumPy A range or lens space in this case is because for the first uh, four values, we go up by five, and then the final values, we go up by 10. So it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work the same way. Um, and also now you get an example of another way that you can um, define levels for your projections. Um, from here, very similar to what we've been doing. These are our filled contours. Um, so then we have our lats longs, and then um, we go ahead and add in our wind speeds at 850 data, um, define where our levels are, give it a color map, 
and then our sorter and transform arguments. From there, we also will let it know that we want a color bar that is associated with our wind speed contours, um, and then just feed in the other arguments that you should be providing for color bar. Um, and then finally, we will go ahead and thin out our um, 850 hectopascal wind barbs. This time we're gonna do it for about every 10th barb um, instead of seventh, so that's where that change is. And just as we did in the previous one, we just go ahead and feed that data in here so that way the barbs know to only go for every 10th one. Um, and from there, just adding a title, adding some grid lines. Um, these grid lines do associate with our latitude and longitude coordinates um, and are at predefined um, intervals on the projection. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. And as you'll see, we have our underlying um, wind speed uh, in our field contours. You can then see our um, height uh, contour lines with our C labels on there. And then again, our um, wind barbs. Um, and again, we verify that it is going in the correct um, rotation. So pretty happy to see this is how it came out. Um, alrighty, so this is our second to last example. This one, um, the only thing that I'll say that you can, that you'll be changing in this is just getting some more practice with get bar for certain variables. Um, and then in this one, we are also using mul the multiple wharf out files. So that's a little bit different for this as well. So the first thing that we do is we actually are gonna use chord pair and we are gonna set a line that we want to be um, creating this cross-sectional plot for. Um, for this one, we are gonna hold latitude constant, but our, or, yeah, and then our longitude is going to be uh, vari variating, there we go. Um, and then, so that's, you know, we've already done something similar with coordinate pair. Um, so that'll be fed in a little bit later. Next up, let's go ahead and grab our variables. So the first one is sea level pressure, SLP. Next one is height. And we're gonna use um, regular, I believe regular height. Oh, sorry. We're gonna be using Z for this one. And then uh, DBZ, uh, DB and Z for our DBZ argument. And then this one is something we haven't seen yet. So negative one just means that we're using our last element in the sequence. So this is gonna be our final time step um, in our wharf files um, variable that we are calling in. So first thing we do is we go ahead and do our vert cross um, and we let it know that we are doing Z against height. Um, and Z here is just going to be for our, our um, it's linear compared to our DBZ. Um, for just interpolation. So it, it is still reflectivity data. It's just been linear, linearized. <laughs> is that correctly? Um, and then here we have our Warfin files that we have used in the past to let it know that we have latitude and longitude data. And then that are, so then leading into our start and end point that they are latitude and longitude um, from what we defined up here in cross start and cross end. And then lat long um, being set to true, um, it just lets Wharf Python know to also interpolate the two dimensional um, latitude and longitude coordinates along the same horizontal line um, that we have defined. And then this includes um, information in the metadata, which we also have set to true here. So after we've gone ahead and created our vertical cross section um, computation, and we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and um, turn our DBZ cross section, um, or sorry, our Z cross back into DBZ. So we're gonna just go ahead and take a log base 10 on that. Um, from there, we go ahead and just grab our Latin long coordinates and then get our card card projection for plotting and go ahead and do what we've been doing normally um, why setting a, a figure and then creating its size. But a little bit different change here is that we're actually using subplots now. If you're not familiar with that, the way that this works is that you call your subplot and then this is how many rows, this is how many columns, and then this is the position of the um, axis object that you're putting there. So for this first one, we are using, um, so we have one row, two columns, position one, and then um, sea level pressure is going to be with respect to a um, projection or a map projection. So we do need to let um, matplotlib know that we're using that. And we do that with the projection argument. Next up, we have our DBZ, which is not going to be on a Cartopi projection, so we don't need to define that. But instead, um, here we will let it or let Python know that we're using the second position on our um, subplots. So same rows, same columns, 
or yeah, same row, same columns, but now we're in position two instead. Um, this section right here goes ahead and uses um, built-in Cartify features, uh, natural earth feature, um, to go ahead and grab just some map features that we can put into play later on. Um, so these will bring in state outlines, land, um, or filled in land color, oh my goodness, filled in land features, and then a filled in ocean feature as well. Um, and from there, we will now add in our sea level pressure levels with um, NumPy range. Go ahead and put them in with contour lines. Um, and this is some, nothing that we haven't seen already. And then add some contour labels. Um, the next part is adding our um, cross-sectional line. So that is just to let, is just like a reference line across our um, projection. And so from there, we are able to call our cross-sectional um, start and end. And then um, the way that we're calling it here with the dot long is just because it is in that chord pair. Um, a reused chord pair. And so this is one of the ways that um, you can call the array um, feature long and lat from it. From there, um, we go ahead and add in the oceans, lands, and states, um, nothing crazy. And then finally, we're gonna go ahead and put together the contour plot for DBZ. Um, with this, we do again, create an extra level um, argument and then define DBZ contours, which will be filled. Um, Nothing that we haven't seen or used yet. So again, not going to make you guys do anything there. Um, from that point on, we now add a color bar with um, big dot color bar, add in some tick parameters, which just tells um, that we want to have a label size. So the tick parameter label size will be eight. Um, and then add in those X ticks to um, where uh, latitude and longitude will be across our vertical cross section on the X axis. Um, so from this, you pretty much are gonna be just creating um, or just selecting our labels from our data and then thinning them um, from our data set again. So this one, we only wanna keep about five of them. So we thin it to make it five um, and then go ahead and define those and put them you know, with just some extra um, arguments and just to do formatting. So these are just for formatting afterwards. Um, and then from there we go and put in our Y ticks for our height. Um, again, something similar, we're just using eight this time. We want eight vertical ticks. So this will be our Z coordinate technically, and then adding in formatting labels for that there. And finally, we just put on some X and Y labels and then titles for each thing. So let's go ahead and run this so that way you guys can see it. And from there, we can verify our data. Um, again, this is so this is that line that we added in as a reference line. These are our contours um, from our sea level pressure. And then this is just the vertical cross section that spans this uh, yellow line. Um, and as you can see, when you get to the um, eye of that hurricane, we are missing data, which is um, kind of what we would expect for re reflectivity data um, towards the center of something that's rotating. Um, and then, yep, I would like to just point out our latitude longitude being on this X axis and then height being for reference here, it's the Y axis. But if you think of it in a coordinate reference, this is the Z uh, axis and this is X. Um, so yeah, this is exactly what I've expected with the data that we put in, with the calls that we put in um, and it's been verified. So this final one, um, you guys can just kind of sit back and relax on it. it. This is just a fun way that you can visualize all of your, if you have multiple WARF out files um, and, and just a way that might be prettier than other ways. So essentially what we are going to do is animate them um, using Funk An, which is from Matplotlib animation. Um, so what you do is you create all of the objects that we've been doing before. So we get our, you use get far to get sea level pressure. Um, and I will point out that we're using all times instead of indexing. And the reason for this is that if we were to make an animation for exactly one time index, it would be kind of boring and more of just a picture than an animation. Um, and so we want to make sure that it's grabbing all of the times from our data instead of just one of them. Um, as we move down um, and go just through our basic um, plotting and adding features, all of those calls, um, we'll get to the sea level pressure, or sorry, not that one. <laughs> we'll get to num frames. Um, and it's saying, hey, grab shape 
of the first um, item in the array. And so the reason that we ask for the shape there is be the way that we are selecting it is it's going to return the number nine. Um, so it's letting our function know that we're going to have nine frames. So there's going to be nine things that we, we put through this, this animate function. Um, once we get to the animate function, it's pretty much doing where we put together all of our um, contour plots like we have in the past, but making it so that it can be iterated through multiple times. And that iteration will actually come from when we call funk animation. So funk animation will then create a figure um, to put all of these frames into. It then will call animate and it will iterate through it um, and create a plot for each of the frames that we're defined with num frames. And each of those frames will then last four or 500 milliseconds um, before switching to the next one. So just to wrap things up here, um, go ahead and press play on that. And um, as you can see, we now have a little animation and we can see how this storm is developing and moving um, based on our simulation data. So that's you know just a pretty neat way to um, visualize you know storm data or other data that you might be looking at with your simulations. Um, but yeah, so this is the end of our tutorial. Um, it's right at 12. So if you need to, to leave, definitely feel free to, um, but I'll stick around to answer any of the extra questions that I haven't so far. Um, but I hope that this was a good introductory course for everyone um, and you feel a little bit more comfortable navigating Wharf Python on your own. Um, and like I said, you guys all have the links to um, our resources, the repository, the Wharf Python talk. And um, so, yeah, I hope to see some contributions from you all in the future. And hopefully we can, we'll have uh, some, some good times with this. But yeah, have a great rest of your day. Um, Michaela, thank you so much for the tutorial. It was, it was great. So um, there were a few questions in the chat interface for which we, we um, waited for the end, end Q&A session. So if you are ready, I can direct a number of them to you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so one of them, let me find it quick. Okay, the question is how to get surface precipitation value without getting into any relation between rain and C, rain C and rainish uh, functions, I think, and how to get sailing height. Um, sorry, I was gonna say if I can maybe scroll back to where it was just so I can see what variables. Okay. For sure. Or do you know what the actual variable name were, was? Um, so let me just try to reach out the correct person. So Shubham, are you around? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so could you please elaborate your question for me, Kayla? Uh, so uh, we are trying to get a variable uh, like uh, we want to get a data for precipitation, which is a surface precipitation. So we are going through that. So work out file have a uh, variable name like rain nc, rain inc, and uh, some variable like rainish. So I don't know how to calculate that exactly. Okay. And you said that it wasn't already on um, our API table. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to the link of it so that way we can check it together. Um, so this is just our get var um, table of available things. Um, so if we don't already have the, um, the variable on here, um, there's definitely the ability of us to go through and add it somewhere. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be an immediate thing, <laughs> but if you have, if you would like to, I should say, um, you can definitely open an issue on our GitHub and just, you know, say, hey, we would like this, this um, variable. Um, it's not already on here, which I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm trying to go through and make sure, because it, yeah, it looks like the only um, precipitation-based one is just the precipital water. And I don't think that's, that's what you want. Um, overall. So yeah, if, if we don't have the actual variable yet, definitely just go uh, feel free to open an issue with us. And I would definitely like to, I would love to take a look at it and see what I can do um, to maybe add that into our available diagnostics. Um,
because we definitely are open to growing and, and adding things over time. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, and, and another question. And sorry beforehand, uh, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt the flow, but maybe we could we could need to turn back to some plot throughout the Jupyter notebook for this question. Anyway, the question itself is here in the plot of 850 MB, height of DM, wind speed of KT and barbs of KT. Why don't we have colors in every point of our map? Um, oh, okay, perfect. Let me get down to it so I can explain better. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming you mean the fact that this is, um, it's not the same extent, right, um, that we've been looking at. And so the reason why is because this is interpolated. So these values, I don't want to say that they don't exist, right, but they are calculated values. Um, and so basically when we call that interpolation function, um, where is it up here? So when we were interpolating, for example, just with height, um, we were saying, let's look at only, or let's look at, um, hold on, I have to word this correctly so I don't confuse people. Um, we were looking at the height of the pressure at 850 um, hectopascals. So if we were to come down here, there isn't gonna be data necessarily for 850 hectopascals everywhere. Um, and so that's why we aren't seeing it everywhere. Whereas um, before, when we did something like this, um, we are looking at those pressure levels everywhere. Um, so these are, you know, pressure contours that are gonna be all throughout the map. Whereas the interpolation is only at that 850 hectopascal level. So the only thing that will be displayed down here is the thing that falls in 850 hectopascals, which also is why our our shape of it is a little bit wonky. Um, but if you kind of think about it with respect to a pressure contour, it makes a little bit more sense um, why it's shaped like this and why things would be not square and pretty, um, kind of like what we had from before, if, if that makes sense. Okay, and um, yeah, th th this question was from Konstantinos. So, if it is not an answer, or if you were looking for another detail here, please let us know, Konstantinos. And uh, one more question from the uh, previous uh, chats. Let me see. Okay, this, this question is from Deepak Sahu. So how to use a shape file to overlay with work output? And second, how to plot polygon average values, say temperature per wind speed, based on the shapefile polygons? Mm. I'm going to have to say I don't know <laughs> right okay. now. Um, I just okay. haven't used shapefiles um, that extensively. Okay. But I will say, I was going to point you over to our uh, GeoCAD examples library, where we do have some shapefiles. Yeah, yeah. Examples, but I'm not sure if they're going to include the information that you're looking for. Okay. Um, so um, I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have also recorded this question of Deepak Sahu for our future reference, uh, Michaela. We mm -hmm. can, we can uh, work on it afterwards. And maybe if we can find anything, we can still uh, reach out to Deepak Sahu for that one. And there were some error questions which I recorded down and asked people to create issues for them. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have access to your chat interface? From yeah, now? Okay. Uh, I'm looking okay. at it right now, yeah. Yeah, so because um, uh, the, the uh, final thanks and, and uh, other texts included some questions. Mm -hmm. You can also walk through them by yourself. I'm around, so we, we can just start from the very bottom, which yeah. is question on the cross-section panel plot. Did you see that? Uh, yes, yeah. so the okay. one from uh, Lyndon. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm not sure if someone was trying. No, okay. Um, so question on the cross how do you get an arbitrary slash diagonal cross-section for this? 
is it possible to overlay a topography cross section um, on this cross section? Um, so my first thought is yes, it, it, it would be possible to do a topography. Um, and the reason that I say that is because topography goes into the Z direction and when we do vertical cross sections, it works out um, data wise. Um, to get an arbitrary diagonal cross section, I believe the answer again is still yes. Um, so when we did, let me go back to the very, very, very beginning one where we did the vertical cross section. Um, where, nope, it was that one. So when we did, or defined it as this, um, or these coordinates, uh, these are pretty much as close as you'll get to arbitrary um, for doing a cross section like this. And that's just, I say that with respect to the fact that this is literally just going from the lowest possible point to the highest possible point on, I believe this would be a diagonal um, when we're looking at the, the actual grid. Um, so it is possible to do it for just for arbitrary points. Um, I want to say that we do actually have examples on the Wharf Python read the docs page um, that do a, a cross section with less less uh, like with with points that are similar to this but are, are more arbitrary. Um, but yes, the the short answer is yeah. If I were to define pretty much any coordinates that are within the realm of the the data set, it should work. Um, so it doesn't have to be anything too crazy. Um, it can be a diagonal, it can be straight and so on and so forth. It, yeah, <laughs> I hope that that answers that. And then, do you, so how do you get an arbitrary? Yeah. And then, so I'm just gonna keep scrolling up from that. So how do we save and extract figures and animation as high resolution images and video? Um, I believe that's gonna be part of, let's go back down. <laughs> so, there are a couple of different ways that you can save things um, with matplotlib. Um, so one of them would actually, if you were to run this locally, you should be able to save it using, I believe the H HTML5 video, but I can actually um, link to our, our repo for um, GeoCAD examples because we do have an example that is also animations. Um, so with this example at the bottom, this oh goodness, this is actually a way to save things from um, from your Python script into just your local. Um, so if you're looking for ways, there's plenty of other um, you know just materials online that'll tell you different ways to save things. Um, so I don't want to give you just like one answer for that because it will also kind of depend on what you're trying to save and where. So. There is options out there, but these are just some of the ways that I can show you immediately is just by saying Annie.save and it should save to your uh, local directory. Um, and then what about the labels or numbers on X and Y axis for latitude and longitude it is not plotted, it can be shown. Um, yes, so for those, yes, you can plot them. Um, do them here. I don't know if that was asked maybe beforehand. No, that looks like it's afterwards. Um, so when you do that, you're basically going to be using your axes object, and then this is um, a function that's within it. So you set the y ticks. I could even put in here just an array of numbers um, for my y ticks, and it'll put them down wherever it wants them to. So if I wanted this to just only say like 26, and then 91 or something, you know, um, this is how you usually set your tick labels um, is using set underscore y ticks and set underscore x ticks um, in conjunction with our tick label ones that are underneath it. Um, and then what is the format of all the figures created by Wharf Python? Is it publishable quality? Um, so I think the best way to save, <laughs> because there's so many ways that you can save your figures, um, again, it's something that you would, you. I mean, heck, I could even right click on this and save the image if I wanted to do it that way. Um, it also kind of depends on the size of your figure. So if you make a very ridiculously small picture or figure, um, it's not gonna have very good resolution, especially if you're gonna make it bigger. Um, likewise, if you make a giant figure, you're probably gonna have issues trying to make it small um, to fit things. So that's just kind of part of the customization of plotting um, with Python. 
um, you just kind of have to find what works for your situation and adjust as necessary. Um, and then above that, we have a recommendation is a function that would auto calculate actual precipitation rate from the buckets. I think that's what we were talking about earlier. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And then someone actually had said that the NCL website has a calculate rainfall. Um, cool. So um, that's actually really good to know. I'm glad that there's, I'm assuming an ex NCL user that was in the crowd today because our biggest goal right now is to translate everything from NCL into Python. So knowing that we have a function somewhere in there that we can bring over is good news. So hopefully we can get that um, precipitation function over sometime soon. Um, alrighty, and then can we plot the wharf cam output using wharf Python? Um, as long as wharf cam does the ARW version, um, you should be fine. I don't know a lot about Wharf Chem though, so I, I don't want to give you the wrong information on that. But as long as your output is ARW, you should be fine to use Wharf Python. Um, and then what is the best way to plot a georeference TIFF image under wind barbs? I am not sure. Um, I would assume that that would actually fall potentially under matplotlib um, and plotting with that. But if it's if it's not wharf based, I, I'm not sure. I can't, I don't want to again give you the wrong information there. Um, okay, and so righty. so it looks like that those are the questions that were answered or asked right before the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank so, you so yeah. much, Peter. Um, and yeah. then yeah, if you guys want me to, I can keep answering because I saw like 17 more questions came in while I was answering those. Um, so yeah, um, we can save the chat file. Yeah, that would probably be the best route. And yeah, yeah clean like I said, up we'll, and, uh, and then send it to you and you can fill the gaps. Uh, if there are any questions that not, not answered yeah. during the session and we can fill in, we can then post it probably somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll open an issue on the Wharf Python repository, um, like the actual repository, not the tutorial repository, um, and answer those questions there, I think. That, yeah, that, that's also a good good way to, to uh, get the questions to you right directly, yeah. I'm ready. Cool, well, awesome. Um, yeah, thank you for everyone again for participating today and hopefully we learned some things, um, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wow, it's a pretty <laughs> intense uh, an hour and a half. But thank you very much. And thank you for everybody for joining. And I hope uh, this provides a starting point to use uh, War Python. And uh, yeah, we'll see most of you tomorrow, I hope, uh, to continue our workshop. Um, okay. Bye bye for today, I suppose. <laughs>